In this video we're going to be looking at Alpha Protocol, a peculiar mix of third-person stealth shooter and western role-playing game. It's an uneasy mix, but an interesting game. Let's get into the details of it. It's common for video games to let you play as spies. What's less common is getting to decide what kind of spy you want to be. The well-worn subgenre of espionage, in movies, television, and video games equally, from James Bond to Burn Notice to Splinter Cell, bring with them a collection of tropes and expectations that make a pretty clear blueprint for a contemporary action thriller. You've got a protagonist with special abilities and unique access to equipment and information, you've got an implicit need for stealth and discretion in your violence, and you've got antagonists who work for shadowy, semi-legal organizations who can scheme as wildly as the writers are willing to let them do. The game design elements for espionage titles frequently come from directly translating the tropes and traditions of spy media that came before. The plots, the stealth, the globetrotting action, from Metal Gear to Deus Ex to Hitman and beyond, these games all take the flavor of the espionage subgenre and translate it into an immersive action gaming experience. But, by and large, they also lack one thing that's key to successful spy movies and shows, the banter, the camaraderie, and the human element that makes spies so charismatic. To put it another way, games are much better with translating a Daniel Craig kind of James Bond, violent, brooding, and professional, than they are at translating a Sean Connery or Pierce Brosnan kind of James Bond, who use a smirk and a clever lie to advance the plot as often as they use a gun. Alpha Protocol is one of the first games to try to address this missed opportunity, to try to put the player in meaningful control of the tone of their own spy. You can play Alpha Protocol as a violent mercenary, or a resourceful smartass, or as an honorable patriot, or a freewheeling mix of all three. Alpha Protocol introduces a whole host of elements from Western RPGs, like dialogue trees and an experience-based leveling system, and tries to blend its traditional third-person stealth gameplay with them, hoping that the combination will be more successful than its individual elements. It's billed as the first espionage RPG, and it is, in many ways. Deus Ex was a more ground-breaking espionage title, and also incorporated a player agency in a big way, but it was still primarily an action title. Alpha Protocol really is, much more obviously, half RPG, half third-person stealth action. The fact that the division between these genres is so obvious within the game is its fatal flaw. But there are things that Alpha Protocol does uniquely from every other game on account of the ambition to blend these two gameplay genres. It is a remarkable, fascinating mess. The thing that held back Alpha Protocol the most is that, ultimately, it's not that fun to play. There is much more third-person stealth content than there is role-playing content, and the third-person stealth is incredibly mediocre at best and impossibly tedious at worst. The problem, and this is a fundamental problem across many design decisions in the game, is that it seems to figure that being innovative in how the player characterization was achieved lets it off the hook for standing out in any other way. The enemies all look incredibly generic and comic bookish, the settings are all well-worn standbys, the dusty Middle Eastern warehouse, the museum seemingly without exhibits, the dusty Far Eastern warehouse. The primary way the player interacts with the game, through the stealth action levels, is the least polished part of the entire affair. While it does frequently accommodate multiple paths of approaching a goal, the game never really even approaches Deus Ex in terms of complexity in navigating the environment. The multiple paths are not distinct, and you run a very serious risk of missing important plot information if you aren't searching literally literally everywhere along multiple paths for dossiers. Even on easier difficulties, the threshold for being detected by enemies during stealth sequences is very low. The threshold for everything, in fact, is skewed towards unplayable extremes in the beginning of the game so that as you level up, the action becomes more fluid. Obviously, that's the point of a leveling system, to give a concrete, tangible progression to your character growing more competent in the field. However, almost all of the skills are combat-related, and by the time those skills are any good, you've had to play about half the game with your accuracy literally artificially hobbled. To make it so your skills with gunplay are more reflective of the player character and player point distribution and not the player's skills themselves, your shot are outrageously inaccurate and useless unless you hold your aim and wait for a shrinking target reticule. And only after investing heavily into one or two particular weapon types does the game let you use those weapons in a way that we would be considered normal or unimpeded in other, more regular games. If you choose to prioritize these skills in the early game, you'll miss out on a handful of skills that assist with hacking minigames, which are a real letdown and annoyance in themselves. You are hacking and breaking into things constantly in Alpha Protocol, but the minigames get irritating very quickly and do not improve with increasing difficulty. 
It's not even predominantly optional, like in Bioshock or Deus Ex Human Revolution. To get the most out of the plot, you'll spend probably a full 10% of your playtime mired in three pointless minigames. There's the lockpick minigame, which is the same as you'd find in The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion and elsewhere. The bypassing minigame, which you'll use for doors and alarms, which is basically a maze challenge. Find the root of numbered nodes in order before the time runs out. It's an easy game until the end of the campaign, where you'll have up to 10 nodes to do in about 20 seconds, all designed to trick the eye. If this was occasional, that's not a bad design. However, without investing in stealth skills and praying heavily, the game's enemies will detect you over and over again. If you play a combat character, you'll be in a constant state of detection, which means that enemies will flip the alarm every other room you walk into, which then loops obnoxiously and endlessly. The only way to stop the sound of the alarm is the bypass, so you can either put up with a repetitive klaxon for literal hours of gameplay, or you can do this slightly less repetitive minigame for a smaller but still significant amount of game time. Alarms are implemented in a way that has few gameplay consequences besides adding a couple of enemies and making the player feel annoyed, and that's a feature that the game can live without. Then there's the hacking minigame, where you have to find lines of static code among constantly shifting numbers and letters. Failure to do so in the time allotted will trigger an alarm, and the harder hacks have you looking for two sets of four in a massive grid. Of course, you've probably already triggered an alarm, but the fact that the consequence for even minor missteps is forcing you to play another minigame and then this one again, while sirens complain at you, is incredibly off-putting. Investing in a character that makes combat easy puts you at the mercy of these dumb minigames. Investing in characters that make these dumb minigames easier puts you at the mercy of the game's incredibly inconsistent and broken combat systems. Alpha Protocol is attempting to use RPG progression to make each build feel unique. They only succeed in determining which parts of the game are annoying in the beginning, and which parts stay annoying through to the very end. Regrettably, even if your skills in combat improve, the combat system never really does. It has some serious inconsistencies, on top of the fact that it is awkward and boring. Especially bad, since combat is a foundation of the game. Even if you're pursuing a non-violent path, you'll have to tranquilize or dart and kung fu your way through dozens and dozens and dozens of enemies who all behave the same. Sometimes they're police, sometimes they're secret police, sometimes they're mobsters, sometimes they're other spies. They all seem to share the exact same AI patterns, and they don't really look too different from one another. The blandness of the levels compounds the boredom considerably. It's not just having to wait for the aiming reticule, it's that every dimension of the combat system that isn't distorted by the RPG elements also feels incredibly derivative of every other third-person stealth shooter. Not only derivative, but subpar by the standards of the games that it's trying to imitate. There are seldom moments of serious tension, although you are given occasional opportunity for a protracted and tactical firefight. Unless the plot demands something else. In a few instances, you have to go up against enemies who you know are innocent, or whose good side you want to stay on. Your only recourse is uh, using your pistol with expensive and rare tranquilizer ammunition, which you may or may not have invested in, and your martial arts, which you also might have skipped out on. If you still want to go through these sections without bloodshed, good luck, and get ready to constantly reload your game. Just because you're role-playing one way in conversations doesn't necessarily mean it will match what you're able to accomplish in the missions. The boss fights are a major example of this, and one in particular, your fight with Braco. Braco is a Russian mobster who fights you in a glam rock battle arena with a submachine gun in each hand until he snorts cocaine off some knives and then comes at you with those. Better have some relevant combat skills because he absorbs more bullets than all of his henchmen put together to finally go down. All boss fights are like this. Marburg, when you encounter him in Rome, uses the same attack pattern as Braco down to the knife, although he's classier about it. A sudden break from the normal rhythm of combat, where you can at least use multiple builds effectively, to these multiple bullet sponge boss fights against weird cartoonish villains and claustrophobic arenas is a major annoyance and a major discrepancy. There are some boss fights versus helicopters and tanks, but they're equally frustrating and poorly balanced. There are moments so heavily gamified, and gamified badly, that it really breaks the sense of continuity in the story. It feels like a lot of disconnected elements blended without rhyme or reason. So it is in both the gameplay and the story, but in the story it works a little better. If Alpha Protocol was simply its action moments, if it were judged purely as a third-person stealth title, it would be a miserable failure. It does nothing to distinguish itself from the things that it does do differently than other stealth titles, with the progression system and RPG elements actively and deliberately take away from how playable the game is. So why do people even still talk about Alpha Protocol? Why is it so frequently referenced as an overlooked classic? 
Luckily, it's much more clever in how it handles its story than with any element of the moving gameplay. In the story, it actually does some amazing and groundbreaking things with constructing a truly modular plot influenced in many different ways by player choice, player attitudes, and player accomplishments. It is a technical achievement in RPG storytelling, not because of the actual details of plot and character which are mired in conflicting cliches, but because of how truly freeform it is and how it's able to reconcile many different elements of player agency in ways that larger, more traditional RPGs like Mass Effect actually tend to struggle with. The scope of the game has something to do with it. It only takes about 15 hours to thoroughly explore and beat Alpha Protocol. All of its interlocking parts are introduced, expanded on, and capped off in the time it would take you to do the first region of The Witcher 3 or Dragon Age Inquisition. The biggest hurdle to accommodating player choice in sprawling RPGs is that, over time, the branching choices compound and require more and more changes in the script. A shorter RPG puts a cap on the increasing narrative drift between player choices. Alpha Protocol has an introductory level, an introductory region, three plot hubs with a half dozen or so missions apiece, and then a climactic mission to tie it all together. The regions are remarkably interactive with one another. Do Moscow first, and they'll talk about your choices in Rome, and vice versa. The way you interact with different characters and organizations is frequently affected by the order and context in which you encounter them. For example, you'll have an easier time trusting Z when you encounter her in Moscow if you're already familiar with the fact that Marburg is a very bad man, and vice versa. And then there's the framing device. The game is told in flashback, mostly, framed by your character Mike Thornton being interrogated by the game's big villain, Henry Leland, after he turns himself in at the, ga set at the start of the game's climactic mission. The frame is a fantastic way to increase player investment in their character. Not only does each flash forward of the interrogation review a player's choices for a certain mission or series of missions, it gives the player an opportunity to justify their choices or express regret in the face of a skeptical, accusatory recounting of those events. The back and forth between Thornton and Leland is great, and keeps up the pace quite nicely. Way before the player starts to understand what's going on, the interrogation frame reassures them that all of these disparate elements will at least eventually come together in some meaningful way, even if you can't see it quite yet. The elements really are unbelievably disparate, though, and that does take a lot away from Alpha Protocol's consistency of presentation. It's not just that the player can choose the tone with which they interact with the plot, choose what kind of spy they are, it's that Alpha Protocol tries to put every kind of spy trope that ever was into a single game and hopes that it works. So you have serious plot, like the whole game thread of Halbeck, an American defense corporation trying to secretly start a cold war to ramp up profits without understanding the situation they're engineering will create a hot war instead, a World War III that will consume the globe. It's a nice bit of Bush-era villainy, drawing on well-known current events like Halliburton's shady dealings and the U.S.'s short-sighted foreign policy decisions in the mid-2000s. Leland, as the self-satisfied suit behind the mess, is a solid and likable villain. His lapdog, Marburg, was once in the same position Thornton is now, a disgraced agent who can choose between being forsaken and being someone's lapdog. Marburg likes Thornton and sees a lot of himself in him. And then there's Shahid, the terrorist leader who you can choose to execute or spare at the end of the introductory region. He is likewise nuanced and pleasantly complex. These characters represent the more realistic end of the game's spectrum of characters. At the opposite end, you have bizarre cartoons like Omen Deng, who seems to have stepped directly out of an anime, or the mysterious Albatross and his organization G22, whose involvement was never satisfactorily explained in either of the two playthroughs I've done of this game. His henchperson is Sis, a sulky teenage girl who never speaks and dual wields revolvers. She makes no sense whatsoever. It's, a, it's as if they were thinking, what spy franchises haven't we covered? And the answer comes back, spy kids, I guess. Z is similarly ridiculous, a former KGB woman who primarily exists in the plot to relentlessly hit on Thornton while machine gunning fools and wearing a tank top. Here's the twist. She's 40! The game is continually cracking wise about how 40 is too old to be sexy or a spy, much less a sexy spy, and isn't it funny that she tries anyway? There's villains like Braco and protagonists like Stephen Heck, a conspiracy-obsessed, torture-happy American woe-bro kind of dude. The cartoonish end of the spectrum is populated much more heavily than the realistic end. Then there are a lot of boring clichés in the middle. Scarlet Lake and Mina Tang, the two other main women characters, are taken right from central casting. Scarlet's a ruthlessly competent journalist who's secretly a double agent. Mina's a technical wizard with a heart of gold. The game tries to cover so many different tones that a player can't predict if the next mission is going to feel like Jason Bourne or Johnny Quest. It relies on clichés and expectations so heavily that it feels like Obsidian had no confidence in their own ideas, which is unusual for the studio and highly problematic for the game.
So it's a damn good thing that they nailed the dialogue system, at least. Alpha Protocol's greatest, most meaningful contribution to game design is the first in-game conversation system I'd seen that truly approximates banter and the rhythms of lengthy back-and-forth conversation. Before a character is done speaking, a very short timer will appear with an array of responses. Usually, you have ethical divisions in these sorts of games. The good response, the evil response, and the neutral or mercenary response. In this game, you have aggressive responses, flippant responses, and professional responses. They cover a similar spectrum to the morality-based responses, but they aren't as reflective of your overall personality. By refocusing on the tone of your response instead of the intent, it frees you up to not only switch up your approach for different characters, but frees you up to lie in a meaningful way. The dossiers you find contain information about the temperament and values of other characters, allowing you to roleplay and say what you want to say, or lie and say what they want to hear. There's no karmic penalty for being aggressive when speaking to the mobster. Violence is what he respects. There's no karmic bonus for being polite to a politician. They have something you want, and the flattery is tactical. You, as a player, get to decide with every sentence if you want to be manipulative or self-expressive. Both work, and they often work in beautiful conjunction. This is what's so amazing about the game. Sure, the characters are silly and the plot is unimpressive and the gameplay is flat and bad, but you interact with them in a way that feels much more realistic and vivid than anything else on the market in terms of conversation. Deus Ex Human Revolution tries to tackle many of the same design choices Alpha Protocol did, but does it better almost every step of the way. Except here. In Human Revolution, there is one correct way to complete each conversation, only one series of responses that yields meaningful results. In Alpha Protocol, each branch is equally legitimate. You can choose to make other characters mad, choose to lie, choose to tell the truth, and all of them will meaningfully branch the conversation in a worthwhile way. You can fail the conversation in Human Revolution. You can't fail a conversation in Alpha Protocol. And whatever dialogue choice you have highlighted when the other character is done speaking will be the selected outcome, so the rhythm of speech is constant and seamless. None of that go make lunch while the NPC patiently waits for the player to decide business. This fast-moving and dynamic system colors everything, from how the player characterizes Mike Thornton, to altering the moving components of the plot, to how in-game romance is handled. Alpha Protocol's take on RPG romance is especially notable. Even if the game's women characters are tired cliches for the most part, and even if the game gives you dumb rewards for getting them to have affairs with Thornton, I actually consider Alpha Protocol an improvement on typical Bioware-style video game romances. It's not like there, where you just keep making the same choices and being nice for long enough, and that will automatically yield true forever love. Here, there's no pretense of deep relationship, just flirtation and interest in a way that makes conversational sense. Take Scarlet, for instance. It's really obvious that she's probably going to be written as a potential romantic interest for Thornton. But to get there, you have to treat her with professional respect as a journalist, not treat her in a dismissive or sexist way, and then to play it cool and confident when the flirting finally does begin in earnest. You have to think about what Scarlet would respond to well on a conversation-by-conversation, line-by-line basis, and if you care about that. She's obviously playing some angle on Mike. Do you really want to be close to someone who's clearly manipulating you? Whether it's flirting with Mino or messing with Marburg, the sense of flowing, shifting, meaningful conversation progression is ever-present and incredible charismatic. The third person stealth is half the game, and it's awful. These RPG conversations are the other half, and they are so fluid and well constructed that it overcomes the fact that the characters themselves are maddeningly inconsistent. Ultimately, Alpha Protocol is a phenomenal example of what happens when a studio has a great idea and a great ambition that they don't seem to have the resources or confidence to fully pull off. Alpha Protocol's enduring popularity stems from the fact that the modularity of the plot and the dynamism of the conversation system are enough to accomplish what the game set out to do in the first place. Let you play a spy whose personality and experience with the game is fully and fantastically customizable. Its short length and fast pace also help make up for its technical and imaginative shortcomings quite a bit. If one level is bland or obnoxiously designed, if one character is laughably absurd, you've moved on to the next so fast that you're bound to find something you like in any given hour of play. And the breadth of the game's responsiveness to player choice, the amount of feedback a player gets about their personalized experience, is remarkable. Yet there's no way I can see around the fact that it's more chore than entertainment to actually play the game. It makes you appreciate the recent trend of choice-based adventure games like Telltale's Walking Dead series. Telltale does not waste resources it doesn't have trying to do something derivative. It cuts to the core of what's necessary for a genre and focuses in on it. And it makes you appreciate the care taken with great AAA espionage titles like Human Revolution, which tackles RPG-like character progression and stealth-based gameplay in a much more nuanced, natural, and balanced way. And 
Ultimately, it also highlights the fact that however complicated and intricate the ways that modern RPGs handle dialogue, those systems have very gamified, formal dialogue. Alpha Protocol is the only game I've ever played where a casual conversation feels casual. The only one. There are many better written games, you can throw a rock and hit any number of them. None of them have valued banter and lying so much as Alpha Protocol has, because to no genre more than espionage is banter and lying important. I wish that the game had been more original and more consistent, though. If its plot had been more tonally consistent, the way a player reacts would feel more real. The kitchen sink spy fantasy wackiness that the game devolves into from time to time detracts quite a bit from the meaning of the player's tonal choice. What does it matter what kind of spy you are if the kind of spy movie you're in keeps changing? If it had been more original with its gameplay choices, it might have come up with something better suited to the talents of an RPG studio. Instead, it's a cut-and-paste mess that's artificially hobbled by the RPG elements, the elements that are the only original thing about the gameplay. If you care about dialogue, about player choice, more than you care about gameplay or writing, you'll like it. If you only care about the gameplay, you'll hate it. If you like games that try hard and fall short, like I do, you'll at least find Alpha Protocol to be mesmerizingly bizarre. There's no denying that the game is a mess, but neither is there any denying that there's no other mess quite like it. Thanks for watching. I'd like to take the time to thank some of the people who are currently supporting me through the crowdfunding website Patreon. My channel is entirely crowdfunded at the moment, and every little bit helps. However, the people who are currently donating $10 a month or more include an entirely large list of generous people like Cassie Bayer, Christian Zacharyanson, Soeb Sheik, Pat Hay, Yuri Petnes, White Zero, Espen Steinsnes, Ervin, William Kreusch, Joshua Hartnett, Oliver Handleken, Joe Wolf, Kimo Heikinen, Stephen Person, Richard Stevenson, Jonas Neefs, Hakan Sealealu, Jonas Rock, Stephen Lark, Preston Allen, Daniel Zooks, Signa Jensen, Ken Young, Dalton Seiler, Nobody, Jonathan Flerkener, Sil, Sangusta, Ryan Gunst, Brad Wallace, Connor Biblo, Kumarin Vijaya, Chocolate Cake, Annex of Rhodes, Neil Bach Frummer, Spyro Sedaris, Kevin DeBolt, Rob Clark, Matthew Lagden, Harley McAvoy, Valentin Selesnyov, Jared Liebmiller, Michael Gillis, Brandon, Carl Gleason, Tim Marsh, Richard Williams, Jack Tainty, Taser Vicarian, Dan Noon, Dan Reitz, Jared Meyer, Justin Hughes, Aiden Kennedy, Florin Sabau, Chris, Joss Farkas, Ivan Martinov, Jake Brennan, Brad Carr, Colin, Lars Ingvar Anderson, Andreas Larson, Finn Spencer, Adam Shelley, Devin Knoll, Morton Scanning, Brett Giamo, Gallac, and Chris Worsidlow. Thanks again for watching.